Hi, I'm Kelly at Book and Paper Arts, and in today's video, I'm going to talk about tearing and cutting. If you came here specifically for the fussy cutting, you can pop on ahead. It's about the last 10 minutes-ish of the video. But if you want to stick around, I can tell you that I wish I had known some of this stuff when I first started out. I cut for about two years working on collage as a hobby before I knew that I could improve. So if you want to find out more about some of the tools and techniques that you can use for cutting out your backgrounds and your focal points, here we go. If you like collage arts, journal arts, altered books, and vintage books, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on the notifications and you will have more of them in your life. Now let's go cut stuff. I do a surprising amount of tearing as opposed to cutting, probably about half and half. That is partly because often when I do a, a layout, I start with another page as the background. That might be something that's handwritten or printed text, sheet music, or a map. And this is going to be my layout background. And I don't want this white border. I could cut it and uh, do that, but I'm going to just tear using this straight edge. Now, you can see that it's got this slightly rough, slightly irregular border. Now, that's okay for my style because I really like that. I use a, the, the torn wallpaper, the peeling fresco look. So that slightly irregular edge suits my style. If you want a pristine edge, you can do that with a blade. And we will talk about that in a mo. Now, it might seem that tearing from the most narrow edge would be best efficiency wise. I don't know why the brain wants to think that, but the brain would be mistaken. If you tear up from a narrow edge, it will often give up halfway through and then you got to fix it. And let's just skip that part. So be sure and tear from the, the bigger part. When you are tearing using a straight edge, this is so easy to do this, this easy mistake. I do it all the time still. And that is you want to load your pressure up here on the top because that's where you're starting. You want to get a nice clean start. That is important. But then you forget halfway down. And when you start tearing about this part, oops, there goes gravity and your page slips away from you and you got to fix it. So be sure that you remember you want that clean start, but you want to keep pressure along the whole straight edge. All right. I have a feeling this tearing is going to sound absurdly loud on camera. And now I've got a layout that can go in an altered book, an art journal, or an illustrated journal, whatever I'm going to be working on for my collage piece. Finally, occasionally you can tear an image. It's better when you do this if you choose an image that is has very clean lines, not too much going on there. Um, then you want to start tearing. Now there are two ways you can tear this way or this way. Look, if I tear this way, I'm getting some white and I don't want that. You see how that white papers. So make sure that you pull your image in a way that leaves the white 
part behind and gives you a cleaner line. Sometimes you got to do it both ways to make sure. And there we go. That's fun. And sorry, but we can. There we go. We can start the page. A fun variation on the torn straight edge is to use a decal edge ruler. See, it's got teeth here. It's got teeth here. Mine is by Fiskars, but there are lots of the different ones out there. Now, you have to put a little more effort into this because the paper wants to resist the teeth sometimes. The thicker your paper is, this is pretty glossy, the more you're going to have to really work it around. But you can do that. And now this makes a fun, pretty, different kind of an edge for your page. Then you've got these teeth over here. That looks good. If your paper is resisting, something you can do is just take some clean water and add a little bit of a water to the line you're going to be tearing from and let it work in. And that's going to make your paper a little more forgiving on that line. And like I said, that is a super fun effect, a way to add some distress and texture to the layout you're starting. I don't use a box cutter every day, but it is a good tool to have in the repertoire, especially if you're cutting something heavier, such as cardstock, watercolor paper, uh, or in my case, I am often putting niches and things into book covers. So if you're doing heavier work, treat yourself to a box cutter. Mine has a retractable blade and I think it was maybe $7, should be about six pounds and you're good to go. Inside, it has extra blades. Now, you want to be sure that you change your blades as often as you need to. On paper, that won't be very often. But uh, sometimes I'll be making a heavy project such as a, a children's board book. This is an altered children's board book. And inside are these 3D arches and niches. That was a lot of cutting. Here's one in progress, and you can see cutting through a lot of heavy layers. I probably went through three blades, box cutter blades, just on this one project. Because if you wait and you let it get a little bit dull, it's going to make your job a lot harder and it's going to be less safe. So be sure that if you're working on a heavy project, you change your blades a lot. They're cheap. Moving along blade wise, this is my craft knife. In America, these are called exacto knives, but it is a paper scalpel. Some years ago, I treated myself to one made by Swan, same people who make the fountain pens, and this is made in England. It will last forever. Not the blades, you still have to change those as needed. But you can also get them almost everywhere uh, in any make. 
they they sell them in Poundland, they sell them in Dollar Tree, and they will do you just fine. I'm cutting this on a this is a, a cutting mat. It's called a self-healing cutting map, and it is a great tool to have. It will save you a lot of grief. Also, these lines are terrific if you do want a pristine line because it lets you line your paper up and look here at the top and here at the bottom. It's on the 250 mark, on the 250 mark, so I know that I'm going to get a straight line. Now I'm putting my straight edge up against 220, and then 220 down here, so I know that that's going to be consistent all the way down. Again, make sure that your pressure that you're holding is taut all the way along the straight edge. Hey, presto. You can use a craft knife to cut out images, but I rarely do. It's as if in the cutting world, there are two schools, the craft knife school and the scissors school. And rarely the twain shall meet. What can I say? I'm definitely a scissors gal. But I wanted you to know that it is a tool that's available. I have personally with my own eyeballs seen people make the most extraordinary filigree paper lace using a craft knife. So it can be done. And if you think you want to try it, I'm sure you can find a lot of helpful information here on YouTube. A variety of this is the this is the, the handheld, I'm sorry, finger held craft knife. This one's made by Fiskars. And it is meant to give you a nice control. Very, very close here. So if you are thinking that you're going to lean towards scalpels, craft knives, check this out. They are pretty inexpensive. The last time I checked, they were under $5, four pounds ish. And, um, it might just suit you. So see what you think. Scissors. I'm going to start talking about what scissors I don't have here. And those are embroidery scissors. They probably seen them. They're about that big and they have very fine blades. I know collage artists that swear by them, and I get asked about them all the time. The idea is that because the blades are so small and so fine that you're going to get precision where precision is really needed. But I'm thinking it's because I have big chunky fingers that I found it difficult and unwieldy, unwieldy to work with those myself. If you have success with embroidery scissors, why not write about it in the comments below and then everybody will get a different perspective on how that works, please. Uh, let's see. Here are some scissors I thought I would love. They are by Tim Holtz. And on one side of the blade is this super, super subtle serrated edge. It gives the scissors some tooth. And the idea is that when you're cutting something, that, that tooth will grab the paper and give you more control. Again, I'm thinking it's not Tim Holtz, it's me. And the kind of images I cut, it didn't work as well as I had thought. I do use them for some other cutting things. What I do use are Cutter B. Cutter B. I will write that in comments below so you can see how that's spelled. I found these when I went through a, uh, a, a spell where I wanted to up my cutting game. And I had some coupons for you know where. And I just tried a bunch. I actually tried pairs that were more expensive than these. 
and they didn't work as well. I think the last time I bought these in the States, they were about 11 bucks. In Britain here, they are about 12 pounds 50. But they are the scissors that I ride and die for. I have a pair at my mom's in Mississippi. I have a pair in my son's house, a pair in my flat, a pair in my studio. And if I'm traveling, I've got some in my suitcase. Cutter B is not paying me to say all this, although I wish they would. Hey, Cutter B, give me a call. Again, feel free to write in the comments and let us know what kind of scissors you love. To cutting. My first best advice I'm going to give about cutting is don't cut too much. By which I mean, don't cut. Don't snip, don't chop. I snipped for a couple of years before I figured this out. Instead, what you want to do is line up your the blades of your scissors on the edge of your image and squeeze. Just squeezing your blades together and instead of chopping, you're feeding the paper into the scissors. Now, clearly I'm going to have to move my blade now, but again, open them up, squeeze, go around the image, feed the image, feed the image into the scissors. Don't make the scissors chase the image. Now here, advice number two, there is no need to go around and cut out every little uh, edge there. If you do, uh, kudos, I admire you. But instead, how about just going around making a wavy line? Again, I'm feeding and squeezing and waving. So what I have now here is a little bit of movement in the leaf, a little bit of movement there in the leaf that does suggest that it has some, some movement to it. It's prettier, but I didn't have to sprain my wrist. So consider faking it. My next advice is choose your image wisely. You will notice that when I chose a flower to demonstrate on for the camera, I went with something big and blocky with not too much detail. I did not, for instance, use this or this. These are fantastic images and I will be using them in some projects, but not ones where I have to cut every single fern or frond. I could if I had to, but I don't have to. I can choose an image that will be big, bold, and beautiful, but not break my heart or my wrist. Here's another. Now here's an example. This is a, a, a harder, but doable. You can see here that Got a lot of big blocky parts that will not be too hard. And even this, it is more challenging. It sure is, but it's doable. So I could see, I put this in the maybe pile. And let's look at this, these guys. Um, this is, is beautiful, but I do I know from experience that I don't want to deal with all these twigs. Instead, I would choose from the box of birds, I would choose this one, which has got, uh, instead of twigs, I mean, it does have twigs, but I can cut around those and just go with the branches. And that's going to give me a powerful image in my layout. So when you're choosing images, be sure that you don't set yourself up for failure pick something that's doable.
There is a school of fussy cutting that deals with these uh, elaborate details by just going around the piece and leaving a nice, healthy border. It is a way of making your piece precise. See, and again, I'm feeding, squeezing, letting the paper do the work, mostly. Okay. And now you have a piece that is, it's still really punchy, even though it's got this border. So let's look at that. You can, uh, you've got these, they've got the borders, but they're still, these would make really, really dramatic, punchy embellishments if added to an art journal page. So don't be afraid to get those fine pieces and just leave a border there. Let's say you do want to try and tackle some medium difficult foliage or bird's legs or something like that. This is a little bit scary. Don't be afraid to go ahead and cut into the image. Okay, see what I'm doing here is I've actually cut that apart there, but now I can go in without too much mess and make some nice clean cuts here. And then when I get ready to use this in a, a piece, I'll just glue that down very carefully. And hey presto, it's one thing again. It's what I did here with this hydrangea. I cut into this piece, then I was able to get to the stem. Unfortunately, then I didn't know what I know now, which I'm gonna tell you is that I should have left something on that stem like I have here because in the couple of years since I cut this out, I have put it in layouts and tried it and it never quite works. So I haven't used it yet, but I've handled it a lot. And what's happened is that this uh, stem has become very fragile and I'm afraid it's, it's, if I do that much more, it's going to just bust on me. So now when I cut out fine pieces, I do most of the work, but then I leave something to support the piece while I'm handling it. And that's a bit more robust. When I get ready to use this image, then I can go in and uh, cut that out, make it really, really perfect and flush. Or I can combine these techniques and leave a little bit of a supporting border. It's going to look good either way. Now I'm going to combine a few of these techniques and speed up Ms. Camera and show some cutting in action. There you go. I fed my paper, let the paper do the work, squeeze the blades, cut into, bisected the, the image to get a clean cut. I've left a little bit of support here until I'm ready to use it. And then I'll just clip that. And I've done some waving, a little fake in it there. I'm working on this oversized altered book. 
and I'm going to get to use some of my bigger images. Really looking forward to that. So maybe on the cover or maybe part of a layout of a page. I don't know, but I will keep you posted. Now, at the end of the day, there's not any difference between cutting out that sunflower and cutting out images like this that may, on the surface of it, look more challenging, but they're not. Got some clean lines here, and then you can just fake it in other parts. Same techniques. So get out your coffee table books and your glossy magazines and just start cutting. You will probably learn by doing some things wrong. And if so, welcome to the club. Just get started and have fun. Please join me for my monthly online newsletter. It has art tutorials, free scans, sometimes a giveaway, uh, the occasional pep talk, and good stuff. The, the link to subscribe to join me is in the text below this video. If you would like to add any of your tips and thoughts about fussy cutting, please let us know in the comments. We're all going to learn something. Until next week, happy cutting.